pleasure to introduce Joe Herring. Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. Uh, let me begin by saying that uh, I'm not used to speaking. I write. And even though my, my writing gets seen by literally hundreds of thousands, uh, I'm still nervous speaking to a group of people. Okay, so please bear with me on that. Um, I originally came to this article because I live in Bellevue. I'm, I'm from here. I've lived around the Missouri River my entire life by and large. Uh, I'm not that far from it. I've seen what's happening and wondered why. How did we get to this point? Um, I originally looked at this thinking that, well, it couldn't have been uh, recognition of endangered species that did this. It couldn't have been you know, that type of mismanagement. Um, and I approached the article from that way of thinking. I thought, well, okay, I'll find out what really is causing this, and then I'll address it from that stance. The deeper I dug in, the more I found out that, in fact, that was probably the main driver. I'm not saying that caring for the endangered species and operating the river dam system rel or related to that is the sole cause, but I am saying that it is the exacerbating factor that caused this to go from normal flooding to this debacle that we're seeing now. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about, uh, I imagine most of you have probably read the article. Uh, people who work for the Corps, there are very, very many good employees there. There are people that, that blood, sweat, and tears and feel terrible about what's happening. It's not necessarily the Corps' fault as much as it is the fault of the operating manual that they are forced to follow. Okay? There's, it's called the Master Water Control Manual. It is the Bible for the operation of the entire system. Now, by way of background, the system was built as a series of six dams designed to tame the Missouri. The, uh, the Missouri is a very, very large and very powerful river. It spans 2,300 miles draining one-sixth of all the water in North America. Okay, so needing to, to corral this thing was a huge, huge undertaking. Okay, the Flood Control, of 19, the Flood Control Act of 1944 is what started all of this. The government built these dams and then crowed about the economic benefit to all of the rest of us by allowing development, both agricultural, residential, and business, along all of the formerly flood-prone areas. Promises were made at that time. Our politicians and representatives and our agencies of the federal, state, and local governments all said, there's land now, use it. We built our levees, we built all of our infrastructure based upon the type of flows we were told we were going to get. We didn't base our levees on a 500-year flood followed by a 100-year flood, followed by a 300-year flood, followed by a 1,000-year flood that we have to hold back for four months. And that's why you're seeing what you're seeing. The river is 8 to 11 miles wide in places. Okay? It doesn't do that. It didn't do that before the dams. Okay? The reason why it's doing it now is because the dam system is an incredibly brute and powerful thing because it has to hold back one of the most brute and powerful forces that nature has, a river. Okay? Water is the ultimate solvent. It beats everything in the end. So to play with a dam system is akin to playing with a nuclear bomb, only the devastation is a bit slower. Okay? The energy is equal, okay? far, far in excess if we see a dam failure. Now, the people who are in charge of this, how did we get to here? Well, for the first 30 years of the operation, everything went pretty well. The system was designed well. It did what it was designed to do, and it allowed for a massive economic boom. During the first 30-odd years, from 1950 to 1980, the, there were minimal floods. Okay? There was, obviously, you're always going to have some. It is still nature. But we built and we grew 
all along the river. Navigation grew, recreation grew, hydropower grew, all of the purposes for which these dams were built were served. Then around the late 70s and early 80s, the environmental movement began to rise with a subcurrent. That subcurrent is the river restoration group. They feel that dams are, well, basically evil. <laughs> they should not be on a river. We should leave rivers to themselves. We are the infection, the river is the cure. Okay? They would like to see the development removed. Okay? They're the AmericanRivers.org, the Sierra Club. There's a, a, I could run the list down in, at length, okay? but all of them have the same common thread, and that is we shouldn't be anywhere near that river because the river has to breathe. The river has to do what it wants to do. Well, I'm sorry, there's 10 to 12 million of us that live on that river based upon the promises our government made to us 60 years ago. Okay? We're not leaving. We can't leave. Many of us are forced to now, but that's not, that's not nature. That was man. And I wrote the article with the intent of shining a light on a process that most people don't pay attention to. I mean, we have lives. We, we don't have the time to read the 400-page, stultingly boring material that is put out by these groups. They, they tell us what they intend to do. The only problem is they tell it in such a way that no one can possibly absorb it unless that's your job. Well, I've read the water control manual. I've read the, the supporting material, and it is as boring as I said. But it also tells you exactly what has happened. About 30-odd years ago, the priority of flood control was turned on its head. Okay? It still sits there at, at the top, but there are all these qualifiers that were added to it when the environmental groups sought a biological opinion from the Fish and Wildlife Service. This biological opinion was sought to determine the effect the dam systems were having on some bird species and a, and a fish species. Those amendments through the Clinton administration were incorporated into the water control manual. What those amendments said is that flood control is still the number one priority except, and then it added, as long as it's not hurting the birds, as long as it's not hurting the fish, as long as you're not doing this, this, that, that, and the other, and we need to study this, this, that, it goes on and on and on. Um, my, greatest, my greatest desire from this is that people will take a look at the process. There are some representatives in the room. I hope that you can communicate to your bosses. I hope you can communicate to everyone who will listen that until we get control of that process back, this is going to continue. Okay. Great example. Uh, they want to build habitat. And we spend 40 million odd dollars building emergent sandbar habitat for these birds to nest on. Well, they used black geotubes, which is a large fabric covered tube that juts out into the river and is designed to catch debris and sand and silt and form a, a man-made sandbar for the birds to nest on these wizards of smart neglected to note that animals are attracted to heat. Well, gulls are attracted to the black and the heat and they came and ate all of the eggs from the piping plovers and the terns. Okay. So now we've got to yank out all of these and put in sand covered ones, okay, and sand and white colored. It's that type of thinking. It's a zero sum type of thought process that doesn't allow for any kind of dynamic input. Okay. It leads to a, a narrow definition of everything. If I have money, it's because someone else does not. If I have access, it's because someone else does not. If there's a river, then it means someone is being displaced. Okay. That's not reality. And what I hoped to bring to the, to the fore with this article was a little common sense, a little reality, and shine a little bit of a light on it. Um, I'll. At this point, I'll, I'll open the floor to questions uh, regarding anything about the article uh, or anything about the river, and, and I'll answer those all to the best of my ability. Uh, sir. Uh, Senator Bradley and Darrell, uh, Representative Darrell Eaton, uh, 
uh, in Washington are on top of it. Senator Grassley, especially our senator in Iowa, and he has raised the same issues as you are raising on this. Uh, I didn't see your article, and I'd love to have a copy of it. Uh, I'd like to put it in my newsletter. I'd be happy to. Uh, we need, we need people like Senator Grassley, and we need the power that comes behind the office. You know, at, I can approach the core, and I can approach these groups with a request for information. They can approach the core and the groups with a subpoena. Okay? I'm afraid, quite honestly, the, the vast devastation that's coming from this. I, I do fear that the floodgates aren't the only thing at the core that are operating at full capacity. I, I'm afraid shredders are as well. Okay, it's a massive CYA going on right now. People that would originally talk to me now won't. Okay? Articles are being written about my article from people who were previously on my side who now strangely are not. Okay? There's a, there is a tremendous entrenched interest behind this river restoration group. Uh, we all know the power of the Sierra Club. Okay? Well, it exacerbates all of our efforts you know it, it creates a, a tremendous flood of cash and money into into putting forward their efforts over our requirements you know this is humanity we're talking about here there are thousands and thousands of people who are losing everything I've I'm heart sick at the emails that I've received from people who have either lost it all or are about to Mm -hmm. uh, they they deserve a much much better. Yes, sir. Joe, it seems to me part of the answer is going to be litigation against the public enforcers, <coughs> and everybody I think in the Republican Party is starting to see this as we've been setting up with uh, Obamacare and everything else. But I think the answer to what you're talking about is that pressure comes back against you. It's going to be litigation and those attorneys and so forth in the Republican Party. Well, and I think we have some grounds there. Um, I, I received a me an email from someone who wanted to, uh, who asked if I was an attorney, hoping that I could initiate a class action suit. Um, you know, promises were made. We built and and moved to these places. We built cities around the river based upon what we were promised by our government. I don't recall anyone telling me that that was all turned on its head because of a bird. I, do, does any, if anyone in this room can point to the day that we were all told it was not safe to stay here, okay, I'd, I'd be happy to see the documentation. Okay. Yes, sir. The, uh, your thoughts on the reverse direction dikes that were put in uh, over the last uh, decade or so into the backflow areas for the for the fish habitats mm -hmm. and then the litigation maybe leading into some of the farmers creating their own homemade dikes to protect their fields. What you might your repeat the question. Sure. Uh, what he's asking about is is there was a there's been a lot of infrastructure that's been built around the river in order to protect um, species habitat. Uh, one of those being backwaters being built for the pallid sturgeon. Okay. Um, aside from the fact that the pallid sturgeon dates back to the Jurassic era and managed to get this far without us, uh, that being ignored. Uh, let's assume that, that there's a good function and reason for these things. Uh, those can all be dealt with. The sturgeon can be dealt with by existing law without having to flood nine states. Okay? You can build backwaters for them and the Corps has authorization to purchase land for exactly that purpose. And to a willing seller who wants to do it, by all means, do so. Okay? The problem is, is that, and the reason where litigation comes in, is because they're not satisfied with that. They want habitat to be in a certain location in a certain way. Perfect example, uh, I cite Greg Pavelka, uh, who is the wildlife bio biologist out of Yankton, South Dakota, who is in charge of the habitat for the, for the least turn in piping plover. Um, in his Seattle Times interview, where he famously said that this is going to be a, a pain for some small farmers, but an incredible boon for the species, speaking of the flood, uh, he also went on to say that the birds 
are now nesting as a result of the flood. They're now nesting on gravel roads and abandoned boat ramps. He said they adapt. Every year they go up, they go down a little bit, they'll move elsewhere if there's flooding. Oh, pardon me, why do we have you then? Okay, if they're able to adapt and move elsewhere, which we're seeing the piping plover in the least turn during all of this flooding, we're seeing them establish beachheads and, and do all their nesting on the Platte, on the Elkhorn, on any number of rivers around that are not flooded. Okay, th we've, been, we've been taught evolution our entire lives, yet now we're told that we can't allow it to continue. Okay, I'm sorry, but if, if the river's flooding, then the birds go elsewhere. The birds will go elsewhere if the river has a barge on it. The birds will go elsewhere, period. But in that fish and wildlife biological opinion written into the law, it says we must have X number of birds. We must have X number of nests. And we must have them in this location. And these other locations don't count. They won't count those birds on the plat because they're not on the Missouri. You could have a trillion plovers on the plat and it's still an endangered species according to the Fish and Wildlife Service biological opinion because they're not on the Missouri. Now, they, they measure, and to give you an idea just how, how deep they go with this, um, every year they're measuring and counting the number of eggs, the number of nests, the number of birds, the number of chicks, where they're located. They're spending money having teams raise nests in case of rain. They're having I mean, they, they literally count. When they find a dead chick, they send it in for a necropsy to determine how did it die. Okay? This, is, this happens, and it's by taxpayer funds that they do this. Um, and as a consequence, though, their, their studies give us a little bit of grist for our mill. Well, the Corps' actions are responsible for less than 4% of the total loss of all of the eggs and all of the chicks that go of every year. Where do most of them go from, or what, to kill most, what kills most of them? Predators and flooding. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, to those of us who use our mind, this is insanity. To those of us who are paid not to, you know, it's, this is business as usual. Yes? Yes, the, in fact, um, the, of the 33 historical crests on the Missouri River measured at Blair, four of them occurred prior to 1980. 29 of them have occurred since. Okay. They occur because we're holding back water in preparation for what's called a spring pulse. The environmental groups and what the Master Water Control Manual now calls for is the use of these dams not as primarily a flood control mechanism, but primarily as a means to restore the former natural function of the river. Mimic what nature did before we put the dams in. Okay? That is obviously completely at cross purposes with flood control. So each year they hold back a large amount of water during the winter and early spring in preparation for this large spring pulse. And as a result, this time they got caught with their pants down. They had too much water. And they did get a massive amount of rain in Montana. That could have been handled had we not been holding back that water. We, right now, uh, most people don't realize this, but the amount of reservoir storage that is reserved specifically for flood waters, for flood control, is 6%. 6%. Obviously, you're not gonna be able to hold the 250 to 500% greater snowfall that they had this previous year, or the one year's worth of rain that occurred in a four-day period in Montana with 6% of your reservoir capacity. <coughs> Now, one, one last thing, to give you an idea of just how big this is, uh, many of you may have been to Lake of the Ozarks or uh, you know, some of the, the Table Rock Lake. You know, these are very, very large bodies of water. But you could fit 10 or 15 of those into just one of the reservoirs in Montana. Okay. 
that'll give you an idea. These are these essentially, for all all intents and purposes, are inland seas that have been created in order to protect us downstream. Now, the water is flowing at 160,000 cubic feet per second out of Gavin's Point Dam. I expect, based on what the research um, that I've read, that that is going to need to go up before it comes down. The snow melt has not melted. Okay? We're just evacuating the rain right now. The snow melt, which is 500% in some places of normal, is still up there. It hasn't melted to come down yet. Okay? To give you an idea, and I, I mentioned in my article, but 150,000 cubic feet of water will fill a football field of four feet instantly. Okay? That's how much is coming down every second and will be for the next several months. Okay. That'll give you an idea of the scale. Yes, sir. I, I hope I'm not repeating. I think you partly covered this already, but if you, get, if you were to get a direct uh, question about the article that appeared in the World Herald a few weeks ago, denying that uh, species preservation or, or environmental reasons had anything to do with what happened on this year. That, that's probably the wrong way to say it. I, I understand. I know the article you speak of. Denying that they made that a priority this year. They right. realized they had too much rain early on. They quit worrying about all the species. <laughs> well, it's quite simply, it's technically true, but in reality false. Okay. Every one of those, every one of their statements that they make from the Corps says, we have been in flood control mode from day one, consistent with the Master Water Control Manual maximum releases. There's your, there's your caveat, consistent with the Master Water Control Manual. They were still in spring pulse mode. Okay? They were releasing the maximum amount they could consistent with maintaining a spring pulse, not consistent with what you and I would consider to be flood control. Okay. Um, go on. Yeah. I wish I had paid a little closer attention, but in the last week I had heard that, that it was the Bureau of Land Management of the Corps of Engineers had sent letters to property owners along the river if you want to sell your property, which makes it look like, hmm, why did this happen? The Bureau of Land Management of the Corps said, oh no, this happened prior to the flooding, but there's been proof that the letters, some letters that come up after the flooding said that others. All right. this, this, is a, this is part of a program that is 15 years old. They are authorized to purchase land for to the creation of wetlands and this emergent sandbar habitat that they're in, they're in love with. Um, however, the timing of that particular letter went out on June 6th, with all, which also happened to be the same day that they upped the, the waters to 150,000, creating the flood. They claim there was no correlation, and I'll take them at their word. But the, the bottom line comes, comes to this. If you look at the Sierra Club and AmericanRivers.org and all of the other river restoration groups, their method, their preferred method of getting us out of the floodplain is to use taxpayer money to buy our land and get us out. The secondary method is force an easement that has the same effect. The last one is, if you can, use eminent domain and take it. Well, we're not at that point yet, but I would expect you'll be seeing a large push to not allow people to return to their lands and to their, to their homes. The, of course, it'll be, well, we can't afford to continue to, to pay for the damage. We can't, they shouldn't be in a floodplain to begin with. Well, let's, let's take a look at what floodplain actually is. That what AmericanRivers.org and these other groups are thinking of is bluff to bluff. Well, in Pottawatomie, Pottawatomie <coughs> County, sir, how much of council bluffs is on the western side of the bluffs? Well, guess what? You can't be there anymore. Okay? You're, an you're an infection. All of you go. You go now. Exactly. Well, that's, you know, if you look at St. Louis, if you look at Kansas City, St. Joe, Omaha, and you look at a bluff-to-bluff -bluff idea, you're going to remove a good third of all of those cities and all of the people there. Well, obviously, to us, that's unworkable. But to them, they've been working on this for 30 years, which is why Greg Pavelka was, couldn't conceal his excitement when he said that the natural flow of the river would return in one, one year. He was so excited by that. Yes, sir. By the way, don't ever uh, stop 
say that you're not, not a good speaker because <laughs> you've given me more information than I've heard in years. But we Thank are you. a representative form of government. And by that, there are hearings that are constantly going on by the core, by the legislature, <clears throat> by the government. And who attends those hearings? The same people that are promoting it. Exactly. The Club. And, and the farmer who's affected, the businessman who's affected, he doesn't have the time to show up. Well, so he exactly. Doesn't. And that brings me That's to the. We well, that brings me to one of the things I discussed in my article the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee. This is a congressionally chartered committee that is put in place in order to balance these competing purposes of flood control versus species habitat versus recreation, hydropower, navigation, and all of these things that the river has to do. Well, in order to get on this committee, A, you have to have a constituency behind you of some sort. Uh, B, you have to apply with proof of your constituency. C, you are then chosen by the Corps and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Well, of the 70 allocated slots, I could only find four that were not filled by either A, an outright environmentalist advocate, or B, someone sympathetic to that. And when I say that, I'm not saying that the slots are reserved specifically for them. I'm saying that they are being filled by environmentalists. For example, the gentleman who, who uh, is the representative of the Federal Highway Administration happens to be an ecologist with a species uh, habitat preservation major. Okay. That's his job. That's all he's ever done is, is study restoration of rivers and species habitat. May I ask what that has to do with representing the interests of the Federal Highway Administration? I have no idea. Okay. Maybe somewhere he's driven on a highway, perhaps. <laughs> you know, but what I'm saying is, is this is what we're seeing. So it's, it's natural to understand we're going to get an echo chamber. Okay, and that's, you know, they are ostensibly there to protect and balance these interests. How are they going to balance them when they are the competing interests themselves? Okay. Oh, yes, sir, you've been... Uh, yes. Joe, you were talking about evolution earlier, and I recall the project, the Pick Sloan project, how this yes. all started out. Yep. I, I assume, correct me where I'm wrong, the Senate <coughs> started to touch on the end of my question, but... I, I assume that the core was an expert at that time. Yes. And and now I'm wondering, not necessarily why, but should the core, as experts, stand up and be a bit stronger? And probably with the hearings and how can we aid it? Well, here's here's what we need to look at. Um, as I mentioned in my article, if you look at and this is where uh, Mr. Sealer will be, and and other individuals like him will be instrumental. Our natural sciences curriculum is steeped, in my words, in the green tea of eco-activism. You go to any university, you go to even down to the elementary school, um, whether, it's, whether it's open advocacy or whether it's more subtle, the, the bent is definitely to the left and to the environmental side. Well, as a consequence, the governors of states who must name people to these boards and, and who must, you know, put people in place to take care of these situations, they turn to the academics. Well, unfortunately, the academics are coming at it from only one direction. So what we need to do is take a look at, A, what is being taught in those natural sciences curriculum. B, my suggestion is we need to remove that layer completely. I would imagine that we would get, as William Buckley once said, I'd rather be governed by the first thousand names in the Boston phone book <laughs> than by the entire faculty of Harvard. Okay? And he's absolutely correct. Okay? There, you can get what is, in my opinion, an educated idiot. Okay? We, in my opinion, have several of them in Washington right at the moment running things. Uh, we have unfortunately a tendency to respect to the degree and not the result. We need to, to start putting pressure on our representatives to get normal individuals into this process. Okay? For example, let's, let's say the Missouri River Recovery Implementation Committee had a complete layer, say of 15 or 20 lay people. 
people such as any one of you, any one of you, anyone you could pull off of the street will know when something passes the smell test. Okay? Well, these things are not passing the, even the smell test. So I think that the way to solve this problem is we need to get ordinary individuals a seat at that table because until we start squawking loudly enough, and this is where numbers mounts, we, people don't listen until there's enough people yelling. Okay? We can't afford, you know, the way I, I've heard it often said, Limbaugh says it all the time, the reason why the right wing is not as good at activism as the left wing is because we have jobs. Okay? <laughs> we ha exactly. We have things to do. Okay? We can't hop on a bus and go to Washington and stay for a week. Okay? We have responsibilities. We're living our lives. We're the ones working to pay the taxes so that these people can play with damn systems and flood us all out. Okay? That's, my, that's my thought process is we've got to get the representatives to use their power to get ordinary people into the mix. Uh, yes, sir, you've been waiting a long time. You mentioned that this table was built by special interest groups and you had to be represented by special interest groups to get there. Is there anybody representing the taxpayers? <laughs> Not really, no. You've got the, the committee is made up of state representatives, which are named by, typically promoted or named by their governors. Um, you have tribal interests, which is a full quarter to actually, no, a full third of the entire committee. And of course, the tribal interests are there to, you know, they echo the environmental idea. They're, they're both anti development. Okay? They want to, to see the rivers return to their cultural status. Um, the other groups as representatives of federal agencies. Okay? So you've got uh, water quality people, you've got uh, navigation people. The, about the only ones that I can find, that I could find on there was a couple of farmers and a couple of navigation guys. Now, since this article came out, I've had a tremendous, you know, and, and one of the gentlemen over there, or I think it was you, mentioned about that article that came out saying that, oh, species had nothing to do with this. Uh, interestingly, the, the people who wrote that op-ed um, were named as just lawyers, okay? Professors of law from the University of Nebraska and one from South Dakota. I did a little digging to find out because their article oddly appeared to refute almost point by point what I had said in mine, which, by the way, was submitted to the World Herald and was turned down. They said I could have a 200-letter public pulse letter. Okay. Um, now, that all aside, those two individuals, prior to becoming academics and teaching in the School of Law, were both environmental advocacy lawyers working for either Sierra Club or any number of, of these, these environmental groups. I think that maybe should have been put down somewhere in there, that this is where they're coming from. Okay. What they said, if you look in the op-ed, it says you have the Flood Control Act of 44 and you have today. And they said, of course it's flooding. Our, our rules are 60 years old. They neglect to mention that we redid all of the rules in 2006 when we put into play everything that they had been asking for. Now they're trying to blame it saying, oh, well, we need to redo it. Well, it took 14 years to redo it the last time. Okay? It was 14 years of litigation, studies, environmental impact, just plain argument in order to get this put together and create what came out in 2006. You're going to get a lot of misinformation. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, <coughs> it's difficult to weed through it, but um, that's what I'll try to continue to do, and I hope everyone else can. Yes, sir. I've been using your article on with blogs and tweets to refute a lot of the uh, thank you very much the numbers and, and a lot of things that have been coming out. Um, one thing though I want to ask is you said a lot of this came about because of the Clinton administration and amendments, environmental amendments. Can you at some point in time uh, do something with this so we can find those amendments? Because I'd like to see if that sponsor up there of those amendments on the Senate side with Mr. Tom Dash. Oh, Mr. Well, yes, I can tell you, Mr. Tom Daschle was uh, involved in the vast majority of that. Yeah, he was the driving force between the, 
he was one of the driving forces of the Spring Pulse to begin with. Now, he also represented recreation interests in South Dakota, okay, which, which is a whole other thing, but it's, it ties in at the same time. It, it served both purposes equally for him and satisfied two constituencies. But I'd also like to see that look down the line of things as things have come about, uh, whether or not there were certain senators from Nebraska that might have been involved yeah, I'll, by, specifically. Right. I'll be right. I'll be doing <laughs> I'll be doing a follow up article on this. I've been doing research on it. I'll continue to and, and that will be one of the things I touch on. Uh, yes, ma'am, you've been very patient. I just have a question. Maybe I'm missing something. I'm hearing you talk about making comments about people creating documents and such sure. here, and uh, and at the same time we hear uh, other people like uh, one of our Congressman who was recently at, uh, on Scott Voorhees' show and was talking with him, and, and uh, when asked about, you know, should there be a hearing? Should you know? Should well, not until after this is settled. Uh, that right. sounds like kind of a catch-22 to me. It, and and it is. Um, you know, no one wants to to no one wants to be seen as not caring for the people who are being displaced. But from the emails I've received, the best way that a representative could demonstrate that care isn't to go out and shake their hand, it's to get to the bottom of why, they're, why this is happening. Okay? I, I initially said, and I, I've, to give you an idea of how wide a distribution this article has received, I've been doing radio interviews all across the country. So people are you know, contacting me because of this. The, the story has gained traction. Um, what I keep telling them is, if you want to know how to help, contact your state attorney general. They have subpoena power. They are also alongside this river. They can subpoena the information. They can decide, or they can drill down to who decided what and when and for what reason. They can get access to the memos. Okay? They can also institute efforts towards what I feel is criminal negligence. If you are, if what I said in my article proves true that, and I think that in the article I, I made it clear that with the statements of the core, with the research that I've seen, and with their statements subsequent and their evidence of mismanagement, that there is enough of a possibility that there was specific intent to not avert this when they were warned that I believe an investigation is warranted. Okay? They're just too happy about it, quite honestly. And I think we need to have someone look into this. Okay. Uh, oh, over here, yeah. yeah. The research of the, the dam system, did you uncover any red flags as to the integrity of the dam? The, the All right, the dam systems, yeah, the dams, um, the, the, the most dangerous one, or the one at, at most risk, would be Fort Peck. That was the original one. It's also holding back a tremendous amount of water. Now, it's an earthen style dam that was built, well, about 70 years ago now. Um, we've stopped making those kinds of dams because the design is prone to something called liquefaction. It's where the, the underlying soil turns to mush. And this happens when the dam is overtopped. We cannot allow the dam to be overtopped. If it were, it is prone to failure. Should it fail, it will be a domino effect down the other five. Yes, ma'am. My husband has always questioned, since he was a child, why they did a big dam and a smaller dam instead of a big river. Well, they have three large ones, actually. There's three massive ones. And the reason being is that that is where the greatest concentration of water is coming from. You've got the high plains, with all of its snow melt, all the way up into Canada and all across north, you know, the, the northern part of our country. Plus, you've got all of the Rocky Mountains and its snowpack. So they put the large dams up there in order to moderate the flows to the smaller dams downstream. Uh, prior to the dam systems, every spring you got a massive amount that came through without any any concern at all. It just devastated whatever happened to be in its way. Then during summer it would draw down to the point where you know, navigation was not possible. You know, uh, you've seen what happens to wet ground when it turns dry 
Um, it becomes a disease haven. You know, these were the kinds of things that kept people away from the river and exactly the sort of things that uh, our representatives told us back then that we no longer had to worry about. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. What is the common thing we have people responding to your article? Well, you understand that it's a good support for it. There's another example of a failed project. The cost that we're expecting for the detailed interest of the large traffic and the food farms and stuff like that. This isn't worth the expense of the cost. Well, here's the, here's the thing. The barge traffic, you know, and, and what I've been getting uh, is, a, is as far as pushback, you know, because the article has generated some, you know, some pushback. <laughs> they don't like being called out. And one of the things is they're saying, oh, no, it's not us. We environmentalists had nothing to do with any of that. What the real driver behind this is those terrible Missouri bargemen. Okay? The Missouri <clears throat> drains into the Mississippi and uh, the confluence is down about St. Louis. The Missouri provides a lot of the water that the Mississippi needs for its barge navigation on down to the <clears throat> Gulf. Okay? If you hold back too much water, barge navigation suffers. If you have too much water, barge navigation suffers. But we were taking care of barge navigation just fine well before we did this spring pulse you know, game. Okay? That to coin a phrase, that, that argument didn't hold water, okay? Um, quite simply, it was the, the, the game changer was the spring pulse, was attempting to mimic the natural river, okay? Um, let, me, let me put it this way. The environmental groups have a particular aim and a particular goal. Um, their aim and goal is the removal of dams from all rivers. Okay. If you look at the, the aim right in the mission of American rivers is dam removal. Okay. San Joaquin Valley in California has been dealing with this for, for a couple of decades now. Okay. Entire areas that were some of the most rich farmland in the country are now dust bowls because they've been cut off from the river water. And the reason for it is the endangered species. So what's happening is and what we've seen out there has been the San Joaquin Valley farmers were driven off of their land, flooding occurred, and then the flooded areas were declared wetlands habitat. So you could no longer use it. Okay? I expect we'll be seeing the same process here. Okay? That's why I wanted to shine a big enough light or try and shine a big enough light so that when we see that beginning, we know where it comes from and can stop it. Because that's exactly what's, that, what I see is coming. I think we'll see at the end of all of this, after the water recedes, will be the big push. Oh no, you can't go back there. First, we can't afford to protect you. And second, well, you shouldn't be there anyway. And third, it's wetlands. Well, if it's declared as wetlands, now the, the environmental groups who have been given stature okay, by our federal government to sue on our behalf, will sue to litigate, to stop that. They'll, they'll declare them as wetlands and say we can't be there. Well, we have two more questions, Senator sure. Jensen. And uh, Joe, um, I've voted on the Missouri River since the 50s, all the mm -hmm. way to Yankton, down south of uh, Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And up until 1980, every time you were on that river, you saw the Corps of Engineers maintaining levees spending a lot of time out there adding rocks so on and so forth but since 1980 that stopped right. there was no maintenance anymore if the core not only in nebraska but all over the nation has turned into the environmental spectrum not uh dam preservation or or channel preservation correct what they already have. correct and it's because those that to do this would be inconsistent with one of their other authorized purposes, which is the restoration of the river to its original function. Okay? That's what you need to remember here, is that that amended biological opinion made river restoration an authorized function equal with flood control. Okay? You can't have both. One is, is the opposite of the other. So you'd add that with 
the other environmental undercurrents that bubble through it, and you can see why we have water instead of land. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. I the e the, right. Uh, he, what he asked is, what would be the biggest hindrance in the government to getting some common sense injected into the process, uh, if I stated that correctly? Um, the EPA, yes, would be one from the federal standpoint. Um, from the state standpoint and the local standpoint, which is where we can have the greatest effect, uh, it would be the representatives who sit on those committees. Our state representatives can have an impact. Okay? They can, can be pushing for, for changes to this. Now, they can't force the federal government to change things, but they can start raising enough of a fuss okay, that the federal government is forced to notice it. Okay? One, there's one thing that, and, and no offense to politicians in the room, there's one thing that a politician wants, and that's a vote. Okay? And he wants to be on the winning side. Right now, that side's winning. Okay? We need to make sure that they know there's enough people who not one step more, no further, okay? and then they'll start coming over to this side. We can rely on the spinelessness, okay? if, if you will. Okay. It's there. You know, let's, let's be honest. Okay. Let's use it to our advantage. Thank you. Uh, one, last, one last thing. If, if anyone wants more information, um, I have a website. It's called readmorejoe.com. Okay. You can, it's real easy. Yeah, you can go on there and, and feel free to you can subscribe there. You'll receive any, anything I write. You'll receive a little alert saying, hey, there's something new there. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.